Today we're going to talk about the electric force. This is a force that you may have had experience with before. What makes the styrofoam stick to the fur? This is also one of the primary forces involved with all of chemistry. The electric force is also one half of the electromagnetic force, which is one of the four fundamental forces in the universe. In the 18th century, a new force was discovered, which would have an electrifying effect on the world of science. Early on, it was noticed that this force came with two distinct flavors. These two flavors we called charge, and we had to give them some way of telling them apart, so one was named positive and the other named negative. The evidence for why there were two types of charges was that sometimes when you charged an object, they would attract each other, and other times they would repulse each other, which leads to the phrase, opposites attract, and like charges repel. In 1785, a French physicist named Coulomb discovered a law for the electric force. The magnitude of the electric force is equal to some constant times the charge of the first object times the charge of the second object, all divided by the distance between them. Now, these are all in magnitudes, so we're not concerned about direction just yet. My advice is find the size of the force using Coulomb's Law's equation, and then use the fact that opposites attract to determine the direction. Before we get into the details, we need to talk about how is charge measured. This is a completely new quantity, so a new unit had to be invented. This was named 1 Coulomb, or 1 C for short. Now, a single Coulomb is actually an enormous amount of charge, and we rarely see anything of that magnitude. More often than not, we deal with microcoulombs or nanocoulombs. For reference, the charge of a proton is usually referred to as a Q plus or Q sub P, is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Likewise, the electron, or Q minus, is equal to negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Through a lot of experimentation in the laboratory, Coulomb's constant, K, was discovered to be approximately 9 times 10 to the 9 Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. So how strong is the electric force? Let's analyze what it's like for the hydrogen atom. I know this is not a hydrogen atom, but over here is something that more closely resembles it. Now, the average distance between the electron and the proton in a hydrogen atom is, you know, it's pretty small, but 5.3 times 10 to the negative 11 meters. So the magnitude of the electric force can be calculated. So we have the magnitude, it's going to be equal to Coulomb's constant, times the charge of the proton, times the charge of the electron, all divided by the radius squared. If we plug in some numbers and get our handy calculator out, notice how the coulombs cancel out, and the meters, because it's squared on the bottom, also cancel out, leaving us with just newtons, which is a force. Plug in all these numbers, and you get 8.2 times 10 to the negative 8 newtons, which doesn't seem like a lot of force. But you have to keep in mind that the proton and the electron are very small. Of course, they're opposite charges, so this is an attractive force, which is what keeps pulling the electron back towards the proton. Its momentum is what keeps it from falling all the way down. But how big is this force? We could compare it to the gravitational force between the electron and the proton. Recall from earlier units that big G is the universal constant of gravitation, and the mass of the electron and proton can be looked up. We also keep the radius the same as the earlier portion of this problem. This gets us 3.6 times 10 to the negative 47 newtons, which shows us that the gravitational force is incredibly small compared to the might of the electric force. Of course, if it's so powerful, how come we don't see it more often? This is due to the fact that most things in nature are neutral. That is to say, if you add up all the charges, the net charge 
is going to be 0. Now, charge is one of the fundamentally conserved quantities, which means it is neither created nor destroyed. So the total amount of charge you start with equals the total amount of charge you end with, at least in a closed system, where nothing is allowed to come in or out. Now, there are two types of materials that we'll focus on. Conductors, where the charge is free to move about, and by charge I usually mean electrons. Most conductors that you will concern yourself with are metals. The other broad category are insulators, materials that resist the movement of charges. These are things like rubber or wood. Let's say you happen to have a metal sphere lying around as one does. Now the sphere is made of a lot of different electrons and protons, but the total charge is zero because all the electrons and all the protons cancel each other out. If I were to bring in a positive charge from outside, the electrons in a metal are free to move around, so they try to be as close to that outside positive charge as they can. Now the protons don't really move, but because there are so few electrons on this side of the metal ball, it looks like all the protons moved. So we have positive charges on one side, negative charges on the other. So the opposite charges were attracted, the positive charges were repulsed and tried to get further away. If this outside charge were to go away, all the charges inside the sphere would return to where they were. But what if I had two metal spheres touching each other? They are both conductors, so the electrons are free to move from one to the other. Now if our external charge comes back, the charges will redistribute themselves. We can then separate the two spheres. Now the charges are trapped on each sphere. By going through this process, our external charge induced charges on these two spheres. Notice that the total amount of charge, so if we add up all the charges, it's still zero. But we have a minus Q total and a plus Q total. Here I used a capital Q to mark that we added up all the little Qs. Inducing charges allows us to separate charges, which then gives us the ability to do lots of experiments and discover more about electricity.